everybody. Welcome to the workshop of Forum Research Society. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Today I'm going to talk to you about going to war in 1914, what we know now. Uh, my name is Konstantinos Travos. I'm an assistant professor of international relations at Oslo University. And what I'm going to talk really about today is the findings of social science about the causes of World War I in conjunction with the new historiography how that changes our image of the course of World War I. But let's start with taking a jump back to time. And let's go back 100 years. In March 18, 1915, the Entente will attempt to break through the Dardanelle states in Chanakale in order to take Istanbul and force the Ottoman Empire out of the war. This operation will fail. At the cost of 700 Allied sailors will die aboard the three dreadnought battleships Irresistible, Bouvet, and Ocean, and 40 Ottoman soldiers will die in the forts and 78 that will get wounded. This failure will lead in April to the big amphibious assault that will lead to the bigger Battle of Chanakale that people have in mind when they're talking about. At the same time, Memel in Eastern Prussia would fall to the Russian Imperial Army in its US offensive uh, against Germany. The day before, the first battle of Champagne will end in the Western Front, which will kill 130,000 people. And the day tomorrow, Pluto will be photographed for the first time in history. Let's take a step further back in time, and let's go back a year. March 18th, 1940. If you know in the Ottoman Empire, the big event that is happening is the preparation for the great parliamentary elections of 1914. These elections will neither be free or fair, but under the complete dominance of the Committee of Union and Progress would lead to a one-party government in the Ottoman Empire, headed by the triumvirate of Jamal Pasha and Ver Pasha and the Lat Bey, later on known as Talat Pasha. They will lead the Ottoman Empire into the war and in some of its darkest moments in history. In France, you will be eating your croissant and reading your newspapers, and the big event will be the Caleus scandal. On March 16th, 1918, the wife of Etienne Caleus, Minister of Finance and ex-Prime Minister, will enter the offices of the newspaper Le Figaro, demand to meet with the editor-in-chief Gaston Calvet and shoot him six times until he dies. The shooting was over, a scandal was brewing in which Gaston Calvet was going to put forward into the newsletters that will prove that Madame Caleux and Monsieur Caleux had an affair when Madame Caleux was not married to Monsieur Caleux and Monsieur Caleux was married to somebody else. She would actually be found innocent by the court for the murder, even though she technically committed murder. Her honor was impeached, it was considered the fair thing to do. At the same time, on March 17th, 1918, in New York, one Dr. Thomas H. Curtis will have invented green beer. From that day on, St. Patrick's Day will never be the same again. How did we get from the, okay, with the excuse of the Ottoman Empire, fairly bland news of romantic murders, green beer, uh, of 1914 to essentially the apocalyptic battles of 1915. In this presentation, uh, we will talk about the factors that led essentially the European great powers to decide to enter a path of war in July 1914 that will lead to World War I. I will be presenting essentially lots of the work of my advisor, John Vasquez, from his review of the recent literature in the International Studies Review. So if you want to do some extra reading at the end of the presentation, that's a good starting point. Now, let's begin with the old story. The primary and most dominant old thesis about the causes of World War I was the Fisher thesis. And the Fisher thesis essentially laid all the responsibility of the war to these three men. Field Marshal Wolfke, the younger, Chief of Staff of the General Staff of the German Empire, Kaiser Wilhelm II, and Chancellor Theobald Bethmann Holwen. The two main points of the Fischer thesis are that one, 
German leaders have been planning a preventive war against Russia as early as December 1912. And secondly, it was German leaders that pushed Austria to war in 1914, especially with their black check. This thesis is very popular among historians. It is also popular among political scientists that work within, that work within the traditional paradigm, especially offensive and defensive realists, a big example of which is Del Coppola. The problem with this thesis is that this thesis was developed in isolation from any rigorous study of the domestic politics of the other great powers. So we don't actually know what the other great powers might have done that might have fostered the war. The second old thesis is the imperialism thesis put forward by Lenin. The argument here is that the war happened because of the competition of the great powers over dwindling free markets expressed in the form of colonies. And essentially the war was between those powers that were unhappy with the way the world was shared, which were the central powers, and those powers that were satisfied with the status quo. And those were the entente powers. The problem with this thesis is the following. First of all, we are not really sure if capitalism had actually reached its highest point in 1914. The argument being that imperialism is the highest form of capitalism. Secondly, and most importantly, that most too acute aggressive competitors for colonies and colonial influence, Russia and the United Kingdom were allied. The third and final thesis is the tragedy perspective. This is developed by people like John Mersheimer. He himself based on an earlier book wrote in 1916 by one Lois Dickinson called The European Anarchy. The argument of the tragedy perspective is that the war is not the responsibility of anybody that the anarchical character of the international system forced everyone to go to war because they were uncertain about the intentions of the other states and that it was impossible for anyone to avoid the war from the point of moment that the system was anarchical. So there is no point in talking about empirical responsibility, asking who actually did things that broke the war, and there's even less point of talking about moral responsibility, who bears the responsibility for the war. The problem with this thesis is that war is not an act of God or something brought about by nature. It is a social innovation, it is a social institution which has been created by human beings in order to resolve several issues. And it is always the result of decisions made by human beings that seek war. So we cannot throw out human agency from the events of history, especially when those events are human brought about by forgetting or ignoring human agency, we're going to get the wrong lessons about the war. So, what does the new historiography do to try and address these problems? First of all, it focuses attention on the actions of Russia. It opens up the black box of Russia. And Russia is important because the Russian decision to do general mobilization in 1914 is the key that turns essentially a local war between Serbia and Austria into a European war between the Entente and the Central Powers. Secondly, it focuses on the importance of non-state actors. In this case, the Serbian Black Hand, the conspiratorial organization that essentially is responsible for the murder of Franz Ferdinand and also act, has a big impact on the politics of Serbia and the ability of the Serbian leaders to accommodate Austrian de demands during the crisis. And finally, it opens the black box of the domestic politics of all the great powers, not just Germany, and places German decision-making in the context of decisions made by the leaders of all the great powers. Thus, a different picture merges to the one that the old narratives used to put forward. Now, this is a lot of information. And in the social sciences, when we want to make sense of information, we have to place it within a theoretical framework. In this case, I'm going to use the steps to war theoretical framework developed by Vasquez and Senez. This framework focuses on how theoretical phenomena at different levels of social complexity or levels of analysis reinforce each other and bring about war. That's why it's called the steps to war. The levels we're going to focus on are the system and the structure, the dyadic interactions of states, the domestic 
politics of states, and then finally the characteristics of individuals. And we're going to ask two questions. The first question is very simple. Why did a Serbo-Austrian war erupt in 1914? The world war started as a local war between a great power and a minor power. It escalated from that local war to a big war. And it's a mistake to consider the two completely deterministically tied together because there were options that could have been done that could have led still to an Austro-Serbian war, but not to a European war. Now, the second question is what social activity led the Serbo-Austrian war to become a world war? Let's begin by the most complex level, that of the international system and the international structure. There were two main events, two main phenomena at the level of the system that fostered war. First of all, there was the collapse of the norms and the regimes of the Congress system of Vienna. The two most important norms that were essentially assailed were first the inviolability of great powers, that you are not supposed to destroy a great power. By 1914, important decision makers in great in the capitals of great powers had decided that the Austro-Hungarian Empire could be destroyed. Secondly, was the survival of minor states, that you are not supposed to destroy a minor state except if it's necessary in order to keep the peace among the great powers. By 1914, decision makers saw both Serbia and the Ottoman Empire as states that could be eradicated from the map of Europe. These two norms being broken essentially led into a system where survival was in danger and drove the states to find security in the increase of their material capabilities. And most of them found that security through alliances. The problem is that the alliances created were not alliances created to manage politics, as was the usual alliance you had in the 19th century. There were alliances that were considered the sine no qua, necessary conditions for the survival of states. This meant that any ally was always paranoidly afraid that their ally might defect. And a defection by a major ally would lead to their survival being put in danger. As a result, the countries were very willing to unconditionally support their allies and their policies in order to avoid defection. As we're going to see, this plays a big role in explaining German and French policy during the July crisis. The next level of analysis is the diet. And the diet is essentially what is going on in the relations between Germany and France, Russia and the United Kingdom, Serbia and Austria, Austria and Russia, that helped the world move along. Now, one common theme to all the diets is repeated crisis. In political science, we know that repeated crises tend to increase the chance that one of those crises are going to escalate to war. Between 1903 and 1914, European politics was dominated by repeated crises. We had the Serbian regicide crisis of 1903. We had the first Moroccan crisis in 1905, the Bosnian annexation crisis of 1908-1909, the second Moroccan crisis in 1911, the Balkan War crisis in 1912 and 1913, and the Lehman Brothers crisis in 1913-1914. Now, here's the thing. In each of these crises, the states were able to resolve them peacefully, but with the use of coercive diplomacy. Threats of war were made, mobilizations were made, but generally speaking, peace was maintained between the great powers. So this kind of indicates that the assumption that war was deterministically unavoidable during this era doesn't completely hold. However, each crisis that happened had a negative effect on the domestic politics of states. What it did is legitimize those domestic groups that offered war as a solution to the security problems of states, and secondly, help increase their numbers and their domination of the decision-making process. One of the diets had maybe the worst and most dangerous condition present, and that is territorial disputes. The Serbian Austro Hungarian diet was dominated by a territorial dispute that was a result of Serbian irredentism, which was the idea that Serbia must take the territory of the Austro Hungarian Empire and create a greater Serbia. 
uh, we know from multiple works of political science that territorial disputes are the most likely to escalate to war. So the presence of this dispute greatly explains to a certain degree why war happened between Serbia and Austria in 1914. To this was added the fact that Serbia had increased its landed material capabilities after the Balkan Wars by taking all the territory. It was not as powerful as Austria Hungary, but the fear of the Austrians was that if they don't fight Serbia now, it will be much harder to fight Serbia in the future. So the preventive motives within the Austro-Hungarian leadership about the war come from these two things that come together. When it comes to the great powers, three of the diets are dominated by positional strategic rivalry. This is competition between great powers over material, political, and military influence in areas of the world. Austria, Hungary, and Russia were competing over the Balkans. Uh, essentially, Austria saw Russian pan slavism as a mortal threat to its existence. Russia saw Austrian influence in Romania and Bulgaria as interference in what it considered its own traditional sphere of influence. The Russians saw the successes of Austria in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1908 as a humiliation that had to be returned and made good by full support towards Serbia. And this was a rivalry that had become militarized during 1903 and 1914 through mobilization and threats to war. By 1914, the Russians have come to the decision that Austria is the linchpin of any German war against them. And that if they are able to break Austria off from Germany or to take it out, then it will be impossible for the Germans to wage war against them. In the case of Germany and Russia, the positional uh, rivalry is over the Ottoman Empire. By 1914, the Russians have come to the conclusion that the Ottoman Empire is unable to keep secure the Bosporus Straits. The thing that terrified them was the great Bulgarian advances during the Balkan Wars and the fact that the Bulgarians came very close to taking Istanbul in 1913. So they have already started thinking that maybe the solution to our security is that we control Istanbul. The problem was that the Germans had started influencing Ottoman politics in a big uh, essentially penetration of the German Empire through finance, military missions into the Ottoman Empire. So slowly the idea formed in Russia that if they want Istanbul, they have to get through Berlin. Sazonov, the foreign policy, the Minister of Foreign Policy actually said those exact words. Finally, the Russia and the United Kingdom were waging the great game in Central Asia, which was a positional strategic rivalry. What happened is, as we're going to see, British decisions about politics in Europe were heavily dominated by how those decisions would affect the security of India in Central Asia. Another dyadic factor was either real power transition or perceptions of power transition. Power transition is a rapid change in the balance of military capabilities between two states. And many of the diets that we're looking at had indicators of power transition or were thinking that there was power transition. Let's start with Germany and Russia. By 1914, German decision makers had become extremely scared of the possibility that Russia was becoming more powerful than Germany or will become more powerful than Germany once the major reform project that had been started in 1905 was completed. French financing had essentially created an industrial revolution in Russia, and the expectation was that in 20, 30 years, Russia will become a behemoth. So some of the arguments about preventive war that we see in German leaders come from that perception. Now, it's a perception. If you look at the actual capabilities. The blue line is Germany, the red line is Russia. Power transition has not yet taken place. They're very close, but the Germans are still more powerful. But this perception of power transition is the main argument used by those that believe Germany caused the war. Uh, even though, in the opinion of the new historiography, it's one of the contributing factors. And it's not the only ones. At the same time, the United Kingdom 
becomes extremely worried by Russian capability increases. The British support for Russia in the Antarctic Europe is tied to the fact that if you look at the distribution of capabilities, they become almost equal. Only towards 1914 is the United Kingdom increasing again. So the problem is Russia and England seem to be very close to capabilities. Russia and England have a positional rivalry over India. How do you defend India? The main issue for the British is that no other great power is willing to defend India. So when you have a problem with another great power, you have four options. You can balance against it by allying with someone. That's not an option the British have. You can balance against it by engaging in further internal mobilization. That's not an option the British have. You can hide. Great powers cannot hide. You can try to change the international system, create norms that make it less likely that war will happen. One great power by itself cannot do it. Or the fifth option, you can ban one. This is exactly what the United Kingdom does. It allies with Russia in essentially trying to group Russia. This is an 18th century strategy of alliance in which you ally with the most dangerous state for you in the hope that by being allied, you will influence its foreign policy. The problem with grouping alliances is that it ties you to the enemies and the issues of that great power. By that alliance, Russia, England becomes tied to the Russian-German antagonism, the Russian-Austrian-Hungarian antagonism, and perversely, the Austrian-Serbian antagonism. The oldest arms race argument for the war is the German-English one, the great dreadnought race. Uh, that's the first argument that talked about arms races, saying that the arms race between Germany and England was what caused World War I. The problem with this argument is that by 1914, it's over. By 1914, the great dreadnought race is over and Britain has won. If you look at the bar charts, the blue one is the number of dreadnoughts the British had in 1914. The red one is the number of dreadnoughts the Germans had in 1914. And the British were producing more dreadnoughts every year than the Germans. So the British had defeated Germany in the great dreadnought race. And the Germans understood that. We know that from looking at the domestic politics, that they had given up on that idea. At the same time, power transition had already taken place in the case of Germany and the United Kingdom. If you look at the blue line, which is Germany, and the red line, which is England, Germany is slightly more powerful than England. Not that much. So in that sense, the great rivalry between the United Kingdom and Germany that had dominated politics from essentially 1900 to 1913 was dying away. And the decision-making of the English was more driven by their fear of Russia than any fear of Germany. Power transition was the case in some diets. In other diets, it was weakness. In the case of Austria-Hungary versus Russia and France versus Germany, the gap in military capabilities was not fixable. If you look over here, blue is German capabilities, red is French capabilities. Huge gap. If you look over here, blue is Austro-Hungarian capabilities, red is German, is Russian capabilities. Huge gap. France and Austria fundamentally understood that they are weak against their opponents. And they came to the conclusion that the only way they could make up for that weakness was by being allies with somebody who was strong. In the case of Austria-Hungary, that was Germany, and in the case of France, that was Russia. This meant that they considered those alliances extremely important in order to address these gaps, which would lead them to essentially be unwilling to betray their allies in order to maintain peace. Other, and this fear of defection plays a big role in explaining the French and Russian relationship, the German and Austro-Hungarian relationship, and the Russian and United Kingdom relationship. All these cartoons showing brotherly love. Here you have an Austrian and a German soldier kicking around on the Etat. Up there you have a Russian and a French soldier shooting the Kaiser from one cannon to the other. All of these cartoons are propaganda. In reality, in 1914, all of these countries have serious reasons to fear that their allies might betray them. In the case of the French, they feared that Russia would ally with Germany 
because France had been unwilling to support Russia during the Bosnian annexation crisis in 1908-1909. This led the French to be extremely willing to unconditionally support Russia during 1914. They essentially gave their own blank check. The Germans gave a blank check to the Austrians telling them, we will support you, whatever you do. And the French gave a blank check to the Russians telling them, we will support you, whatever you do. Germany and Austria also had these fears. The Germans were afraid that the Austrians would defect and ally with Russia or find some accommodation with Russia and the Balkans because the Germans had not been as supportive towards the Austrians in 1912 during the Balkan Wars as they had wanted. At the same time, the Austrians fear that if they don't show that they are a strong, aggressive, great power, the Germans are going to sell them down the road and ally with an aggressive, great, great power, Russia. So both of these countries have an incentive, the Austrians to show aggressiveness in 1914, and the Germans to support that aggressiveness unconditionally so they can prove to each other that we are indeed secure allies. Obviously, the English were very terrified of Russian defection. Remember that up to 1881, Russia was the ally of Germany and Austria-Hungary. It was not the ally of England, it was the opponent of England. And there was a fear that the Russians would defect and then use their newfound military capabilities to change the territorial status quo in India. This led the English to be extremely willing to unconditionally support Antant policies in Europe and the Balkans so they would avoid a Russian defection and alliance with Germany. Finally, ideology and history play a role. Why did Russia support Serbia? Beyond the idea of using Serbia as a proxy against Austria and the Balkans, there was pan-Slavism, a nationalist ideology that believed that all the Slavs of the world should support each other in creating a great Slavic state. And pan-Slavism was very strong among the Russian elites. The brothers of the Tsar were ardent pan-Slavists. And it was also guiding the policy of the ambassador of Russia into Serbia, Nicholas Hartley, who pretty much followed his own independent policy from St. Petersburg and essentially pushed the Serbians to challenge Austria all the time. History plays a role in explaining the French and German enmity. Everybody thinks about Alsace-Lorraine. and France went to war with Germany in order to regain Alsace-Lorraine, revanche and that thing. In the reality, by 1914, French politicians had become very capable in manipulating Alsace-Lorraine as a political issue. Whenever they wanted, they could bring it up. Whenever they wanted, they could take it out of the political issue area. It wasn't something that was pushing French politicians. However, the indicator of historical enmity that Alsace-Lorraine expressed was something that was strongly present, as we're going to see, in the domestic politics of France. And in conjunction with French commercial interests in Russia and Serbia, and French commercial interests in the Ottoman Empire that would be threatened by the German influence, these made it more likely that France would not essentially sign an independent peace treaty with Germany, even though they don't actually have anything like a territorial dispute divided. Those are the diagonal factors. Let's open up the black box. Let's look at domestic factors that fostered war. Let's start with Serbia. This is the symbol of the organization known as Hrana Ruka. I'm probably killing the name there, so don't take my word for it. Also known as the Black Hand, also known as unification or death. This was a chauvinistic, irredentist, nationalist organization that had one goal, the creation of Greater Serbia, and its targets were the Ottoman Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This was an organization that had a lot of influence and power within the Serbian state. Both the military and civilian infrastructure was heavily uh, penetrated by this organization, and its leader was Dragodin Dimitricevic, also known as Apis who is a big hero in Serbia. This was a ruthless organization. It had created a state within a state in Serbia 
It's later Dimitrievich was actually a regicide. He actually, with his own hands, killed, together with other conspirators, the Serbian king Alexander Obrenovich in 1903. In the Balkan Wars, this is the main Serbian organization that committed ethnic cleansing against Muslims and Bulgarians in the territories of the Ottoman Empire that were taken by Serbia. And they became very powerful after the Balkan Wars. Opposed to them was this guy with a huge beard, Nicolas Pasic, Prime Minister of Serbia and maybe the most important Serbian politician. Nicolas Pasic essentially competed with a black hand over two questions. Civil military relationship, is the army going to be obedient to the prime minister or is the army going to be a power of its own? And secondly, who's going to rule the new knight? The black hand wanted to maintain control of the territories taken by the, from the Ottoman Empire for a long period and essentially use them as their base. Passage wanted the country to be united administratively under the prime minister's office. The existence of the Black Hand put big limitations on the ability of Nicolas Passage to accommodate Austrian interests. Why? Well, they would have killed him. His life was literally at stake. Indeed, if World War I had not happened, by 1915 there would have been a showdown between Nicolas Passage and Dragutin Dimitricevich, from which only one of the two people would survive alive. This was a fight to the death. And actually, in 1916, taking advantage of World War I, Passage put Attis on trial for treason on Trump up charges and had him executed. So the existence of the Black Hand is a big, important factor in why we get World War I, at least why we get the Serbo-Austrian Third War. And by the way, this is a parallel to 9-11. In both cases, you have a small state in the international system within which you have the existence of a non-state actor. That non-state actor launches a big symbolic and destructive attack against a great power. The great power then demands from the state actor to take care of the non-state actor. The state actor says, I'm unable to do that because the non-state actor is so powerful. And then the great power goes to war with the minor power in order to resolve this issue. So if you're ever thinking how World War I is relevant to today's events, well, there you go. Serbia, Austria, Afghanistan, the United States of America. Let's move on to the next country of interest, Austria-Hungary. When looking at the domestic politics of Austria-Hungary, we have one, we have many factors that are actually good in not fostering war. First of all, Austria-Hungary is a federal state. It is made up of two independent, essentially, states, the crown of Austria and the crown of Hungary. And the two are always in competition and loggerheads about power within the federal institutions. And then, what do we do with the Slavs of the empire? Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne, wants to create a Slavic third state in the empire and turn it from a dual monarchy into a tri triumvirate monarchy. Ivan Tsipsa, Prime Minister of Hungary, doesn't want to hear about this at all. And he is opposed to any territorial expansion of the empire in the Balkans. Why? Because it will bring more Slavs into the empire. This means that Tsipsa is also opposed to Konrad von Hotzendorf, who is the general chief of staff of the Austrian army, who believes that Austria must conquer Serbia. So that's the first break on a push to war within Austria. The second break is Franz Ferdinand himself. Franz Ferdinand is an opponent of Konrad von Hotzendorf. Franz Ferdinand believes that Austria should not fight a major war until the domestic political situation and the reforms he wants to do have been completed. On the other hand, Konrad von Hotzendorf asks for war against Serbia no less than 20 times between 1906 and 1914. What happens? This guy gets murdered. You take Conrad, you can't take Franz Ferdinand out of the picture, and there's only one opponent of war left in uh, Austrian politics, Ivan Tivsa. Franz Joseph and Count Brelhort, his Minister of Foreign Affairs, were indifferent to a certain degree. However, with the murder of Franz Ferdinand, 
Beltro and Franz Joseph joined Hotetrov and other world party leaders within the Austrian government and overcome the resistance of Ivan Ivan Tivsa. <coughs> Let's go to Germany. So we started with the Germanic powers. In Germany, the biggest characteristic is the chronic instability of its foreign policy because of the character of Kaiser Wilhelm II, who is a person who tends to talk a lot and then takes back his words and so on. The stability of German foreign policy really depends on the competence of the chancellor. Now, by 1909, this person, Bethmann Polde, has actually taken control of the situation by essentially putting the Kaiser outside the loop of foreign policy decision making. So German policy has stabilized towards the crisis. The problem is, after essentially 20 years of mercurial foreign policy, everybody has formed in the rest of Europe a picture of German policy that is that they are not people you can trust, they're bullies, and you know, if you scare them, they're gonna back down and so on. This is not very smart. Because the other only stable high level foreign policy in Germany is the general chief of staff with Moltke the Younger. And Moltke the Younger believes that if Germany is to fight a war, it has to fight a two-front war. If it fights Russia, it has to fight France, and if it fights France, it has to fight Russia. And he is willing to consider such a war. During the crisis, the period of the foreign policy decision-making that's dominated by the civilians the Kaiser and Bethmann Hollweg, is characterized by a bit of well, instability. But the reality is that both the Kaiser and Bethmann Hollweg do not seem to want a world or a European war. They're fine letting Serbia get them beat up by the Austrians, but they want to avoid a war with Russia and France. And this comes out with their hard to Belgrade proposal, which is a proposal that says to Austria, look, what you're going to do is you're going to take Belgrade and you're going to stop. You Serbians will let the Austrians take Belgrade, you will retreat, and then there will be a European conference that will solve this problem. Unfortunately, the Austrians are not willing to stop. They want to take everything. Uh, the ambassadors who are supposed to sell this plan to the other great powers decide to do their own thing. This is before computers and telephones, so ambassadors have a lot of freedom in doing whatever they want. This is the last war where ambassadors decide a lot of the issues. And finally, Russia mobilizes. Once Russia mobilizes, Kaiser Wilhelm has no choice but to declare a state of war, which means that de facto, the foreign policy of Germany is now decided by this man. And Malta the Younger says, well, there's a certain plan, and we will follow that plan. And that plan means European war. The, there, here's an anecdote that indicates the problem with German decision making. At some point, Kaiser Wilhelm II demanded from Moltke the Younger not to mobilize against France. He told them, we will mobilize only against Russia, we will not mobilize against France, you will change the plans. And Moltke the Younger told him, I'm sorry, Your Majesty, but I can't do that. And the Kaiser slapped his hand on the table and told him, if your uncle was alive, he would give me an option. So that kind of gives you an idea of how bad things are in Russia, in Germany, when it comes to decision making. What about the entire powers? France. French politics is dominated by four factors that make the war more likely. First of all, is the division between left and right. This is the division that started from the Dreyfus affair. In 1914, that division had become active again because of the attempt of the government to extend the years of military service. And there was a belief among the right that a European crisis would be the perfect excuse to get this law through. Secondly, in France, the central bureaucracy of the foreign ministry called the Centrale was an extremely independent and powerful organization that kind of followed its own foreign policy. And this organization hated Germany. They were the ones who bore the history. They hated Germany and they were willing to consider a war with Germany. And they were always undermining prime ministers and presidents that were willing to accommodate Germany. Now in 1914, the problem with president is Raymond Poincaré. 
who's a Germanophone. So that takes away one of the breaks that existed institutionally to the centralist pushing for war. See, the Kaliuk scandal that we talked early on had a perverse resolve for peace. Etienne Kaliuk was one of the main leaders of the accommodationist or peace party in France, and through this scandal, his political career was destroyed. So in 1914, he was out of any ability to influence decisions. And finally, government instability. French governments of the Third Republic were very unstable. Prime ministers essentially fell every other month, in many ways. I'm exaggerating. Which meant that the most stable institution was the president and the bureaucracy. The fact that in 1914, Raymond Poincaré is the president means that the two most stable institutions of foreign policy in France are both dominated by people who do not consider a war against Germany as something to be avoided. French domestic politics, on the other hand, become tied to the Sarajevo crisis. What about Russia? In Russia, the situation is as follows. There is a powerful war party made up of agricultural minister Kirov Shevin, war minister Sukhomilov, and army chief of staff Zelensky. And they are pushing for war against Germany and Austria in order to take Istanbul. That's their goal. They are opposed by the conservative Vladimir Kokotov, who is the prime minister. Now, Nicholas II and his foreign minister, Sir Sazonov, do not really have any views. They're kind of indifferent. Uh, the problem is any small change in this dynamic over here will essentially have a big impact in the foreign policy of Russia because essentially everything comes and starts from the Tsar. Well, in 1914, the Lehman von Sanders affair starts. Russia is humiliated as Lehman von Sanders still arrives in Istanbul and becomes part of the Ottoman military command. This leads Sazonov to join the war party and the four of them are able to persuade Nicholas II to dismiss Kokovots in 1914. With the dismissal of Vladimir Kokovots, the last opponent of war in Russian high government is up. Why is Kokovots opposed to war? Because he believes Russia is not ready. He believes, first of all, the great reforms started in 1906 and 1905 have to be completed. But he's out in 1914. And the war party dominates. What about the United Kingdom? This is another example where domestic politics becomes tied with the Serbian crisis. The dominant characteristic in the UK is the division of the Asquith liberal government between the war liberals headed by Edward Grey, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, the colonial bureaucracy and the foreign office bureaucracy, versus the peace liberals who are generally the ones who are in command of domestic ministries. What happens is as long as Grey is by himself against the peace liberals, he can push a policy of the United Kingdom that is very supportive of the Entente. What happens is Irish home rule. Remember, Ireland was part of the British Empire. There was a debate in 1914 about giving Ireland its own parliament and its, and its actually independence within the empire. This was a huge debate. And there were many people who thought that there would be civil war because home rule was very much opposed by the conservatives. And what happened is war conservatives, like Henry Wilson, the director of military operations, decided to ally with Edward Grey. Why? Because they believed if there is a big crisis in Europe, or even a war in Europe, that home rule will not go through. They will have to table it. So Grey allies with the conservatives in order to overcome the resistance of the peace liberals. So all of those dyadic, systemic, and domestic factors make war more likely. And their interaction makes war more likely. And one of the things is that the crisis that happens is a very dangerous crisis, which creates various psychological and uh, psychiatric or problems to the decision makers added to ones they already have. For example, we have multiple indicators that many of the decision makers in July 1914 suffered from depression. 
And their depression primarily came from the thought that the world they had grown up in, the world they had learned to love is going away because of industrialization. That there is this new world that is not a world of aristocracy, a world of tradition, a world of old values, but it's a world of machines and numbers that is coming. And for many of them, the way to solve this was an apocalyptic war that it would destroy this world and create a new, more harmonious world. If you read Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, you know, Sherlock Holmes, it ends with the thing that a storm is coming and it will kill a lot of us essentially, but it will be a good one for the world. Add to this the fact that many of them are aristocrats and they have aristocratic views of honor and dignity which means that they are very inflexible when it comes to making agreements and making retreats because they don't want to feel that they are weakened. And then minor things that can be important. For example, Kaiser Wilhelm II had a very close personal relationship to Franz Ferdinand. He's probably the only person that was actually really sad in Europe that Franz Ferdinand was married. Not even Franz Joseph was sad. And we don't know how that sadness, that personal connection might have impacted his decision to use specific words and languages when talking to Ser about Serbia. Konrad von Hotzendorf, the chief of staff of the Austrians, wasn't an extramarital affair. He had a lover who was married and he had come to the conclusion that the only way he could win her love for her husband, he could break you know, that marriage and marry her, was if he had won a war, if he returned back as a great victorious warlord. And finally, Nicholas II simply didn't care about the policy of his country. Add to that things like the bureaucratic incompetence of Russia. It is not clear if Nicholas II actually understood that he was mobilizing against both Germany and Austria when he signed mobilization orders in 1914. He might have been thinking he was doing a partial mobilization only against Austria. Unfortunately, because of incompetence, Russia was not able to do a partial mobilization. They either had to mobilize everything or nothing. It's not clear whether the Minister of War and the Chief of Staff knew this, or if they knew this and they kept it secret from the Tsar. So what's the result? Add to that randomness and contingency. As I said, the murder of Franz Ferdinand had a big impact on the decision making in Austria-Hungary. Another murder in 1911 also had a big impact on increasing the power of war parties. Fyodor Stolypin, the Prime Minister of Russia, a very forceful and powerful individual who was opposed to the idea of a war. Why? Because it will destroy his reforms. He believed Russia must go through the 20, 30 year period of reforms before ever trying a war. Well, in 1911, Fyodor Stolypin is murdered. So one of the most powerful inhibitors of war within the Russian government is out of the picture. And bad luck in other senses. If the July crisis had happened six months later, the Viviani government in France would have fallen. And probably Poincaré would have been checked by a left liberal alliance that would be opposed to war. Irish home rule would have taken place in England and had brought down the Asquith government, and together with it, Edward Grey. So all of those other factors, together with randomness, have the result that war parties became more strong than peace parties. On this graph, I have a number of decision makers that belong to each party in four countries, Germany, France, Austria, Hungary, and Russia, and the period from 1890 to 1914. All of these factors self-reinforced each other and had the result that those who wanted war or believed that war was inevitable by 1914 were dominating essentially four out of five great power capitals. The only capital in which things were still uncertain was Berlin. And ladies and gentlemen, when in four out of five capitals the decision makers believe war is inevitable or war is something that has to be pursued, well guess what? You're going to get war. The world war became inevitable because the people who wanted it to be inevitable were the people who were making the decision. If we bring it all together, there is not one thing that caused the war. There are multiple factors working at different levels of complexity that together caused the war. So I'll take your question.
questions now. I have some extra stuff to talk if you want later on. For example, could the war be avoided? And some other fact about Greece, nationalism, the Ottoman Empire, and the central subordinate systems. But I think at this point, I can open it up to your questions. I think it would be more useful. Any questions? Yes. malicious, in my personal opinion, of all the beliefs, because it essentially throws the responsibility of the war to the people rather than decision makers. Now, it's correct for some countries. Nationalism plays a big role in Serbia. The Black Hand is not some small organization of, how can I say, malcontent. It is an organization that has a lot of national support. It is also correct partly in Russia, where pan-Islamism drives the war. But we now know that the majority of the people in Europe did not celebrate the coming of the war as we think. Why? Well, the majority of people in Europe in 1914 are still peasants. And peasants reacted to this war as they have reacted to every other war in the past, as an unmitigated economic and social disaster for them, who will take their children and their workers away from them and send them to the war and destroy their agricultural production. We actually have data. We were very lucky in that the French Ministry of Education, the French being bureaucrats, asked teachers in a large number of communes in France to sit down and write what was the reaction of the people in those communes to the order of mobilization. In 60% of the communes that were looked at, the reaction was negative. From people essentially just coming soothed and depressed to serve in the army because they consider the state too powerful, to people essentially crying openly in the streets, uh, refusing to serve, running into forests to hide, and so on. We know that in Germany, cities tended to be more supportive of the war, but the majority of the population that lived outside of the cities was resigned. Resignation is not the same thing as happy celebration of a war. Most of the people who went to fight in 1914 went to fight because they saw they had no other choice. It was their duty, the state was too powerful, they would rather not have fought. So nationalism does not play as big a role in the coming of the war as many political decision makers like us to believe it did. Because most of them excuse their decisions by saying, if I dare decide this way, the nationalists will take me out. It's true, but who? Not the people, the nationalists within the government. So not mass nationalists. Yeah, since we're here, I will talk a bit about, you know, could the war have been avoided, if you want. Well, John Vasquez believes that a European war could have been avoided by the Haldubrella Great Order. He believes that was the best chance to avoid a European war. Now, the serbo austrian war probably is unavoidable after Sarajevo. Simply the territorial dispute, the increased material capability, of Serbia and the death of Franz Ferdinand created a situation where war was extremely likely. But the world war really could have been avoided. How to celebrate maybe German or Russia defecting from their alliances. It wouldn't be the first time they did it. The Germans essentially sold the Austrians in 1912 and the Russians had refused to support the French in 1911 and 1905. World War could have been avoided by the fall of the Aspen Ministry due to Home Rule, or by a German decision to respect Belgian neutrality. If the Germans had not invaded Belgium, it's not that England would not have gone to war, but England might have waited six months to go to war. Those six months might have been enough time for Home Rule to become a big issue in England and bring down the government. My own personal opinion is that if Franz Ferdinand and Pyotr Stolypin were not murdered, the war would have been extremely hard to come about. Because with Franz Ferdinand and Pyotr Stolypin, Russia and Austria-Hungary are extremely unlikely to go to war. And without Russia and Austria-Hungary being willing to go to war, it's extremely unlikely that Germany and Russia and Germany and France will go to war. But that's my own personal opinion. Now, could the Ottoman Empire avoid a war? Unfortunately not. 
Even if World War I had, had not happened, by 1914, Greece and the Ottoman Empire were engaged in a naval arms race with the goal of fighting a great naval war in the Aegean over the question of who will own the Aegean islands. The Ottoman Empire had bought the Resadiye, the Sultan Osman dreadnoughts from England, and the Greeks had reacted by ordering a German dreadnought and a French dreadnought. So even if World War I does not happen, the Ottoman Empire still gets a war. Now, whether that war has the impact on the Ottoman Empire that World War I had, it's an open question. But very unlucky. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Is there anything about Poland? Poland? Well, Poland, by, Poland in that era is part of the Russian Empire, essentially, the majority of it. But Poland is Slavic. Huh? Slavic. Poland is Slavic. Poles obviously would have liked to be independent, but Poland essentially was so out of the domestic picture of the states that they couldn't drive towards a war. So when it comes to the decision of war, the Poles were welcoming of the war because it was an opportunity to essentially find their independence. You know, Pidulski considered the war a good thing, uh, but they didn't have any role in bringing about the war. The pan-Slavism of Russia did not work with the Poles because the Poles were Catholic. And Russian pan-Slavism was very tied to the Orthodox faith. This is why pan-Slavism also had a difficult time within Austria-Hungary with the Croats. The Serbs of Bosnia were pan-Slavists. Some of the Muslims of Bosnia were pan-Slavists. Some of the Croats were pan-Slavists, but many of the Croats were actually willing and loyal to the empire. What they demanded was the same kind of autonomy that the Hungarians had. So, Poland plays a big role during and after the war, but not in the lead up to the war. Well, continue. If all of those other conditions, or if half of those other conditions were not present, then the murder of these two gentlemen would not have a big impact on the empire. Uh, I don't want to say randomness dooms us. It dooms us when other certain conditions are present. So, you know, if the strategic rivalry, let me put a simple, a, a simple example that I show. If Germany had defected from Austria Hungary in 1908, if the Kaiser had decided, you know what, we want to make an alliance with Russia, World War I wouldn't have happened the way it happened. Maybe not have happened at all. Uh, again, secondly, what I'm talking about here is World War I. You still might have a war. I'm talking about the causes of World War I. The same causes might mean that some war would have happened somewhere between, let's say, 1900 and 1920, but not necessarily this war. Now, the serbo austrian War was extremely unlikely to be avoided simply because nationalism was so strong and so tight to territory. Uh, maybe if Franz Ferdinand had made his big reforms, you know, it would have been harder for Serbia to penetrate within Bosnia and Herzegovina in the politics, but well, that's a maybe. I mean, I personally think that his death was very important, but it's all within all of these other decisions. So randomness is important, contingency is important, but it's not by itself. The things that we control, if we change it, make it less likely that specific random events will lead us to some place. Yes, yes. So when I actually read about the history of class, like people always have comments about like students saying, oh, like an open empire only got into the war because they didn't have much of it. I just constantly hear any comments about well, because you're not really talking about it. I'm not a specialist on that. I, I, Let's get again. Yeah, let's, I, I think they, they have to be just let, let's let's focus on two things. First of all, a war would have happened. What the, the war that Enver Pasha and Talat Pasha and Jamal Pasha were preparing for was the war with Greece. That was the war that was going to happen. Everybody was preparing for this war. Both the Ottomans and the Greeks were spending essentially massive amounts of money. Remember that the Sultan Osman was the first ship built for the Ottoman Empire by essentially popular uh, lotto. Like everybody put their, every little old woman and old man in Anatolia put, you know, their little, I don't remember, Turkish lira or Burush, 
into the box and the boxes were collected in Istanbul and both the ships. So there was going to be a war in Egypt. That was unavoidable. And you can understand that the Greeks considered it very serious because when they saw that the Ottomans are going to get their dreadnoughts much earlier than any Greek ones, they actually went and bought two old ships from the Americans. Useless ships, but two old ships just in case to survive the first month, two months of the war. So there is an arms race that is extremely dangerous. It is one of those dangerous arms races, I would say. What happens is, when the war happens, when World War I begins, the English essentially refuse to give the dreadnoughts to the Ottomans. So that's one strike against the English. Second strike against the English is the fact that Germany has a lot of influence in the Ottoman Empire. The third strike is by deciding to refuse, this is important, by deciding to refuse to sell those dreadnoughts to the Ottomans, the British essentially show clearly that they are on the side of the Russians. Why? 1914, Russia does not have any dreadnoughts in the Black Sea. If those two Ottoman dreadnoughts survive the war with Greece, and in all likelihood both sides will survive on their ships, because dreadnoughts are really strong ships, the, German, the, the Ottomans will have two dreadnoughts that will dominate the Black Sea for the next five years. When the Goemen was given by the Germans to the Ottomans, even though the Goemen was a very weak ship compared to the dreadnoughts that have been ordered from the English, by itself it was so technologically advanced compared to what the Russians had available that essentially up to 1916, the Ottomans did whatever they wanted in the Black Sea. Technology had changed so much that just one ship could completely change the balance of power. So, of course, Enver Pasha would wish for the alliance with Germany because the alliance with Germany gives him what he needs, the dreadnought battleship. And that dreadnought battleship means that it is impossible for the Russians to take Istanbul between 1914 and 1916. It is impossible for the Greeks to essentially force the Aegean issue. So his decision to go to war was driven partly by very logical decisions. And you know, the Allies could have refused to declare war on the Ottoman Empire. They could have refused to answer the war declaration, but they had also decided that since we're going to go to the war, since World War has become, Russia has the right to that territory. So all of these decisions essentially meant that the moment that the Triumvir decided Germany is the only way we can survive, it doomed essentially the Russians. Ottoman Empire into a war. You know, even if they stayed out of the war, if the Allies had won the war, they would have attacked it. Why? Because the Russians have to be repaid. Obviously, they could have refused to you know, go to the war. I mean, it's not deterministic. They could have refused, but not. Not the Committee of Union and Progress. They needed the war also for internal political reasons. It's not just international relations that's important here. It was a good excuse to get rid of their domestic opponents and also reinforce nationalism within the empire in order to save it. Any other questions? Yes, fire away. There's, weird, there's a weirdness in this. When you read the actual writings of the politicians, and I'm going to talk most about the decision makers, you get very contradictory ideas. As I said, some of them were extremely depressed, like seriously depressed. Like, Bevan Holberg would write in his diary, oh, my Eastern Prussian homeland will be taken by the Russian hordes and I will never be able to visit it again. Uh, many of the decision makers were not idiots. They actually understood that what the wars that we were, that were in the 
they were decided will destroy their states. Konrad von Hotzendorf actually writes that this war will destroy Austria-Hungary. This is something that also comes out of writing some of the Russian decision makers and say this war will destroy, destroy Russia. Others obviously had a more, oh, it's only going to be a small war, it's going to be a little fist cut and everything. But it's a weird era because death is cool, okay? Death is cool in this era. The romantic nationalists of the black hand, they say, I'm going to die, but my death is going to grow like, you know, Serbian flowers on the land. So the same people who are seeking death are also people who are celebrating life. They are celebrating life essentially through their romantic option of a martyric death. So it's not very weird that many people will be engaged essentially in these, uh, you know, life affirming events at the same time having a view that, you know, this war that's going to come is going to cleanse us. You know, there's a, there's a view that this war will cleanse the world from, you know, ugliness and corruption and the world is going to come out of it. It's going to be much more golden. Now, simple people, well, no, of course not. Most of the peasants couldn't expect anything different in this war than any of the other wars that were fought between. My husband will go to war. How is my family going to survive for four years without my husband working the till, the fields, and so on? Uh, decision makers, again, some of them say the war is going to be easy. Some of them understand the war is going to be bad and destructive. It's very hard to decide when they are serious or when they're, like, they're telling the war is going to be easy because they want to celebrate. My own opinion from the readings is that many of the decision makers understood that what's starting is not, it's going to be a bit different than what had happened in the past. That this will be a war that will have a big impact on the domestic politics of many states. And many of them showed it. You know, the Tories in England, the war is a chance to resolve once and for all this Irish home rule question. You know, in Austria-Hungary, the Austrian part thought this war is an excellent chance to once and for all break the power of Hungary as an opponent of uh, industrialization and development. Uh, in Serbia, you know, the Black Hand saw the war not only as a chance to create the greater Serbia, but also get rid of passage. So, my general view is that there were enough people who understood that this is a new war, an industrial war, and that it will be very different. There are many people who also said this is not going to be a big issue. I have a feeling that much more saying it's not going to be a big issue that they didn't know what they were talking about, or they were lying. And inwardly, they, do, they did understand what's coming. But again, this is, this is an era where the, it's romantic depression. It's, you know, I'm depressed, but my depression is leading to a new life. It's the, you know, the age of storm and fire and Wagner and things like that. So death is not seen as a bad thing necessarily. But yeah, there were you know, other people who completely ignored that there would be a war. They thought this is just another crisis that is going to be resolved like all those other six crises that were resolved peacefully. So no one, some people had a clear idea, some people didn't have a clear idea. Both had justification. Again, remember, seven, eight crises, none of them were World War between 1903 and 1912. And some of them saw mobilization by Russia and Russia. So why would you expect this one to go to war? I mean, no one even cared about Franz Ferdinand. Kaiser William is the only one who cried and actually felt sorry. You know what Kaiser Franz Joseph said when he learned the news? No one can escape God's judgment. He hated Franz Ferdinand because Franz Ferdinand had married a woman who was not a high noble. She was a tiny noble. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Going once, going twice, going thrice. Thank you very much for coming to this talk. I hope it was uh, uh, educational and useful. If you want to read something based on the talk, find uh, the review done by John Vasquez, an international study review of the new historiography, except if you actually want to read those books. The one of them is about 700 pages, all of the primary sources. Thank you very much.